Okay. Well, uh, last night, uh, I said to Joanna that I had settled on a new sermon series idea called It's Not About You. And the inspiration for this series comes from a Tim Keller quote about the Bible, how we tend to read the Bible as being about us. Uh, so you take an Old Testament story like David and Goliath, and, and we draw lessons from it like we think the star of the story is David and his faith, and we are to emulate that faith and, and kill the giants in our own lives. And you may have heard uh, lessons like that. And it's not all wrong. I don't want to say to disregard that. But those are kind of secondary points, secondary lessons to the things we read in the Bible. Uh, the things we read in the Bible tell us primarily about God. And so uh, I was saying to Joanna, you know, I'm going to do this sermon series, It's Not About You. And her eyebrows raised and said, that's the very thing Kyle kept talking about at Wilmington this week. He just kind of that theme kept coming back to how, you, you know, the youth in our culture, everything funnels, you know, into analyzing yourself, uh, grading yourself, critiquing yourself, promoting yourself, rewarding yourself. And that kind of that inward focus takes over and, 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 and destroys life, really. And so I, when Joanna t told me about that kind of being a theme for the week, I took it as God confirming where we are today. So he has led you here, and he has led us here together to hear his word. And so no sleeping, all right? I will call you out today if I see you sleeping. Um, good thing it's not so warm this week, too, right? Um, well, as I mentioned, the inspiration came from a Tim Keller quote. I'd like to just give you that quote. It's on video with some imagery uh, to it, so this is uh, what I'm talking about. What is the Bible really about? Is the Bible basically about me and what I must do? Or is it basically about Jesus and what he has done? When you read in Luke and Acts how Jesus in those 40 days uh, got his disciples together, 40 days before he ascended, after he was raised, what was he doing? Basically he was saying everything in the Old Testament is about me. He says, the reason you didn't understand what I was about was you didn't realize that everything in the prophets and the Psalms and the, the law was pointing to me. Do you believe the Bible is basically about you or basically about him? Is David and Goliath basically about you and how you can be like David and Goliath or basically about him, the one who really took on the, the only giants that can really kill us? And so his victory is imputed to us. Who's it really about? That's the fundamental question. And when that happens, then you start to read the Bible new, you know. Jesus is the true and better Adam who passed the test in the garden, his garden, a much tougher garden, and whose obedience is imputed to us. Jesus is the true and better Abel, who though innocently slain has blood that cries out, not for our condemnation, but for our acquittal. Jesus is the true and better Abraham who answered the call of God to leave all the comfortable and familiar and go into the, into the void, not knowing whither he went. Jesus is the true and better Isaac, who was not just offered up by his father on the mount, but was truly sacrificed for us all. While God said to Abraham, now I know you love me, because you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from me. Now we at the foot of the cross can say to God, now we know that you love me, because you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from me. Jesus is the true and better Jacob, who wrestled and took the blow of justice we deserve, so we, like Jacob, only receive the wounds of grace that wake us up and discipline us. Jesus is the true and better Joseph, who is at the right hand of the king and forgives those who betrayed and sold him and uses his power to save him. Jesus is the true and better Moses, who stands in the gap between the people and the Lord and who mediates a new covenant. Jesus is the true and better rock of Moses, who struck with the rod of God's justice now gives us water in the desert. Jesus is the true and better Job, 
He is the truly innocent sufferer who then intercedes for and saves his friends. Jesus is the true and better David, whose victory becomes his people's victory, though they never lifted a stone to accomplish it themselves. Jesus is the true and better Esther, who didn't just risk losing an earthly palace, but lost the ultimate heavenly one, who didn't just risk his life, but gave his life. Who didn't just say, if I perish, I perish, says, when I perish, I'll perish for them, to save my people. Jesus is the true and better Jonah, who was cast out into the storm so we could be brought in. He's the real Passover lamb. He's, he's the true temple, the true prophet, the true priest, the true king, the true sacrifice, the true lamb, the true light, the true bread. The Bible's not about you. So what we'll do over the summer is just take some of those examples and kind of explore how these things we read in the Bible point us to Christ, how they are about him, how we can know him better and be closer to him. So, so let's start with the beginning. He mentioned here uh, Christ is the, the true Adam, the true and greater Adam. And uh, now I don't know about you, but I have often read and even taught that the passage about Adam and Eve, is, you know, they bring sin into the world. And, and I recall preaching a sermon where I said, you know, we see here the process of sin taking shape. We see uh, temptation and we see uh, flirting with temptation and we see wanting more power and we see deception from Satan. And, and we see Adam and Eve believing the deception, believing the lie, and the next thing you know, they're taking the fruit. And, and that is all there. And we are wise to see that and recognize that that can be true in our lives as well. But again, it's secondary. Um, if it is about Christ, and Christ has said it was the story of the Old Testament, and that would start with Adam and Eve, then what does it tell us about Christ? So let's look at that. First of all, let's look at the two gardens that we have in these two stories. In the beginning, there was a garden, uh, the Garden of Eden, and there was no sin that separated man from God. It was a perfect fellowship. Uh, there was temptation, uh, but, and, and in that temptation, Adam and Eve were not obedient. And that perfect communion between God and man was lost. Now in the Gospels, we read of a second garden, and that's the Garden of Gethsemane, where there was also temptation. I, I often think about Jesus struggling over this, what he had been called to do and, and praying, Lord, take this cup, Father, take this cup from me. He, he didn't want it. There, I'm sure there was a temptation for him to say, uh, I'm going to step aside, you know. Uh, but he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So instead of disobedience in the garden, Jesus, the second Adam, was obedient. And through his obedience, Christ regained what Adam had lost. Once again, through faith in Christ, we can be one with God. We can, uh, as we were in the original garden, we can have fellowship. We can approach God. We can be in his presence. We can be his again, and that sin will not be held against us through our faith in Christ. Adam's sin, which we inherited, uh, can be replaced with Christ's righteousness, which we also inherit. So that's kind of in a nutshell how the story of Adam is really about Christ. Uh, it isn't about us learning from Adam. It isn't about our temptation, our need to triumph over temptation. It's about Christ's triumph, his victory over sin that was introduced through Adam and Eve. And, and I'm I'm not taking liberties here making these, these correlations. Uh, Paul writes a whole chapter in Romans, chapter 5, where he talks about uh, Adam and compares Jesus as the second Adam. And he kind of sums that whole chapter up with this verse, uh, verse 19, for just as through disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. 
So, like I said, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Nutshell. But let's uh, let's crack open this nutshell and uh, look a little deeper. John 18 is a passage where we get a good bit about this garden, the second garden. So we'll read John 18. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 11, and we're going to be in the ESV version for this. I'm going to start with just the first verse. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. A couple of things to note here. Um, John could have explained to us that Jesus went over to Gethsemane. He could have uh, said it by name in this instance, but he doesn't. He's specific right here. I mean, he's not specific right here about a name, a proper name. He describes it simply as a garden. It seems that John is intentionally leaving out Gethsemane so that the idea of the garden is in our heads. It becomes a, a focus for us, a garden. So he also says this garden was across from the Kidron Valley. Now the Kidron Valley was known as a place of death. Uh, in several places in the Old Testament, it's associated with death. And so, uh, for instance, in Jeremiah, there's a description of mass death, dead bodies and ashes that covered all the fields as far as the brook of Kidron is what it says. And so taken together, John is saying, Jesus crossed the valley of death, whereupon he entered a garden of death. And just as a death took place in Eden, we are being led back to another garden of death. So then he goes on, let's read verses two through eight. Now Judas who betrayed him also knew the place for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. Well, what, what do we see here in John 18 as we look through the lens of Genesis 3, through the second Adam idea? We've seen we have two gardens. Here we see the action of two Adams. And in particular, their actions in the face of punishment. You remember what Adam and Eve did when God discovered their sin and they realized God was coming for them. You know, he's gonna, there was going to be a confrontation. What did they do? They, they ran and hid. Well, Jesus, on the other hand, when the punishers, the, the authorities come for him, what does he do? He he stands up. He says, here I am. Uh, you know, they had tried to hide from God. They had tried to avoid accountability. Uh, that, you know, uh, Adam and Eve attempted to, to refuse their responsibility for guilt. And humanity has been doing the same thing ever since. But what does Jesus do? The authorities come for him. Even though he's innocent, he steps up. He steps out. Here I am. Let these other people go. Let these sinners that deserve death, let them go. And as the rest of the Adam and Eve story unfolds, we see more foreshadowing of Christ, the second Adam. So, uh, for instance, in spite of their sin, when Adam and Eve sin, God has mercy on them. He shed the blood of an animal so that they could see that the wages of sin is death. And then he let Adam and Eve live another day and another day after that and many other days after that. And he clothed them in the skins of the, the dead animal. And as the Gospel of John unfolds, we see the fulfillment of this foreshadowing. Jesus 
taking the wages of sin, which is death, offering his own death on our behalf, and for those who follow him, we are clothed in the garment of his righteousness. He shelters us. He gives us his clothing of righteousness. Now let's look at the, the last two verses here, John 18, 9 through 11. Uh, this all happened to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. I sure do love Peter. I mean, he shouldn't have done that, but good job, Peter. Uh, the servant's name was Malchus. So, one more little interruption. You know, when they say, when they give details like this, the servant's name was Malchus, do you, this was written at a time where, you know, maybe Malchus is still alive, walking around, you know, with a scar. And people, this is real, specific history. Uh, if it wasn't real, people at the time would have said, there's no Malchus. Anyway, so Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Well, this portion deals directly with the issue of obedience. The issue of obedience. And uh, we started with Tim Keller. I want to just quote him on how he wraps up the obedience element of this story. I, I couldn't quite do it justice uh, in my own words the way he does. He says... At the beginning of history, there was also a garden and a command. God put Adam and Eve in that garden, and they were told not to eat of the tree. The direction was, obey me about the tree, and you will live. Obey me, and I'll bless you. But they disobeyed. Now there is another garden, a second Adam, and another command. Jesus Christ has been sent by the Father to go to the cross, which is also a tree. To the first Adam, he said, obey me about the tree, and I will bless you. And Adam didn't do it. But to the second Adam, he says, Obey me about the tree and I will crush you. And Jesus does. Jesus is the first and last person in history to be told that obedience would bring a curse. The Father is saying, essentially, If you obey me, if you are faithful to me, I will forsake you, cast you off, send your soul into hell. And yet Jesus obeyed. Even as he was dying, abandoned by his father, he called him my God. Words that in the Bible were covenant language, conveying intimacy. Even though he was being forsaken, Jesus was still obeying. Can you see the difference between reading the story of Adam and Eve as being about, say, the steps of temptation, and reading it as being about Jesus Christ? our Lord and Savior. There is a big difference, and that difference uh, makes all the difference. Uh, but here's, that's what I want to look at next. So what? What difference does it make? And I want to give you three points that I'm sure we could all come up with many points, but the three that struck me as I thought about this being about Christ, what we learn about him, why is it important to be able to see this in the Bible? So what? Well, um, the first thing that struck me is so that we would worship. So that we would worship. When we see the story of two gardens and two atoms, it should stir in us a knowledge of how amazing and powerful and good and beautiful God is. It's hard to deny that uh, in, in churches these days, church worship services have often become about us, you know, our preferences, uh, and, and this leads to a struggle to worship, um, you know, if, if it's not giving us the right feeling, if we're not getting the right vibe, if it's not touching the right spot, we struggle to worship, but church worship is not about what makes us feel best. It's not about obtaining a certain experience. I can't stand when I hear the question, and I may have asked this before, so I'm slapping myself on the wrist. But have you ever heard someone say, when they went to a church or to a conference, how was the worship? 
how, how was worse? Like, like, like it's something we are to evaluate. Like, was it impressive? I mean, that question and that approach to worship, it kind of, how can you draw any other conclusion than we've made worship about us? Well, worship has nothing to do with obtaining a certain feeling or experience. Church worship should be our best attempt to indicate to God his worth to us. We can do that through stumbling through a song we don't know. You know, we can say to God, I, you know, you are worth me stumbling and bumbling through this song that I don't know and that I might not like because you are worthy of your people joining together to praise your name. When we read the Bible properly, we see who Christ is. We see how God orchestrated all of this and how he spoke through dozens of authors over thousands of years and it, it all comes together. And then we go to church and, and say, you know, how was worship? No, we should go to church and say, God, you are worth everything. You are worthy. If the story of Adam and Eve is seen as being about how we can be tempted and fall into sin, the result is us trying to not give in to temptation. If the story of Adam and Eve is seen as us, as being about the second Adam, who would come and regain all that was lost, then we are more moved to worship, to worship this amazing God who became one of us, that he might take our punishment, that we would have his righteousness through faith in him. You know, and, and we end up in that regard saying, instead of, you know, I gotta get everything right, we say, praise Jesus for getting right what I've gotten wrong. When we see that the Bible, that Christianity is not about us, but about the one true God, our self-consciousness is replaced with worship. Uh, second thing that I think it's important for us to, to see things in this way, a second reason is that it is important so that we join in God's work. So that we join in God's work. You see, if Christianity, if my faith is basically about my personal salvation and God tending to what I need, uh, we're really missing the big picture. Uh, I have read this to you before, but I'm going to read it again because it's so applicable here. Uh, N.T. Wright has a book where he says this, the real point, I believe, uh, I'm sorry, the real point is, I believe, that the salvation of human beings, though of course extremely important for those human beings, is part of a larger purpose. God is rescuing us from the shipwreck of the world, not so that we can sit back and put our feet up in his company, but so that we can be part of his plan to remake the world. We are in orbit around God and his purposes, not the other way around. The earth, and we with it, go around the Son of God and his cosmic purposes. Just because Jesus died for me ought to give birth at once to a deeper realization down exactly the same line. You mean it isn't all about me after all? I'm not the center of the universe. It's all about God and his purposes. I think I may have a misprint here, but it goes on. I am the, uh, Jesus is saying, I am the hero in this play. Even Jesus comes on stage to help. Oh, no, no, no. This is the person thinking uh, that the person is the hero in this play. Even Jesus comes on stage to help me out in the mess I'm in. The earth goes round the sun. Jesus is the hero of the play, and we are the bit part players. The fifth servant, the seventh footman who come on for a moment, say one word and disappear again, proud to have shared his stage, and for a moment been a tiny part of his action. When we see the bigger picture, we can join into it. You know, life is not about self-actualization. Uh, we aren't here to, to become really good at something. We aren't here for fame and fortune or popularity or acclaim or status. 
We are here to serve God, to join in what he is doing. And so another reason that's important to get this straight is that we would join in what God is doing in this world. Thirdly and finally, and ironically, it's important that we get this right so that we can truly become our best selves. You know, if, if our focus is ourselves, we stumble all over our desires, we stumble all over our motivations, our decisions, how people perceive us, our fears, our anxieties, etc., etc., etc. And the result is, we don't find our true selves. Uh, you know, because uh, we miss what we are really here for, to worship God and to be a part of his work. Now, if our faith is in Christ as it should be, then our true selves emerge as we worship. As, and that's not just church worship. That's daily worship. And as we join in God's work, this concept is true at a very practical level. Um, what time is it? Oh, okay. I got time for the quote. Okay. Okay. Um, so this idea of getting outside of ourselves to be ourselves, uh, I, I, it made me think of a, a, a quote here from, now I'm going to tell you this is one of my favorite comedians, but I do not recommend him because he's foul-mouthed really badly. Okay? But Norm MacDonald, um, who I've mentioned here before, um, he became a Christian uh, later in his adulthood, and uh, even then, he still had some colorful things to say. But uh, I, I was listening to an interview with him, and he was saying how when, well, I'll just, I'll just read to you the exchange here. Um, this was uh, in a podcast. He says, when I was young, I was very, very, very shy, and I was afraid of everything. I mean, people say they're shy when they're kids, but it was like a pathology for me. The interviewer says, but aren't you still afraid of everything? I am. I mean, I try to hide it and deal with it, but on a day-to-day -day basis, no. I'm not afraid of everything. I'm afraid of very few things. Interviewer, how, how did you get that peace of mind? He says, it was an experience I had that transformed me some, to some degree as I was always so afraid of everything. If I went to a store, I'd have to walk around forever before I could even face a person in the store to buy a pack of gum. I don't know why I was like this, but anyways, when I was nine, there was a blind friend of my dad's at our house, and my dad told me to walk him to the store. I was like, what? That's a mile and a half walk, and I'm so shy and everything. So I'm walking him to the store, and he wants me to explain everything, to describe everything I see. So I'm like, well, on the left, there's some cows, you know, and a fence. And he goes, is it a wooden fence, nearly petrified wood? I said, yes, it is. How big is it? And I said, oh, about three feet high. And I said, John Neal McGarrison used to own this land. And he said, I don't want to hear that. Just tell me what you see. Tell me what is. So all of a sudden, I saw things as they were. I was very young, but I'll never forget it because I had to see for this blind man. I had to see and describe not my opinions, but reality. So when we passed John Neal's house a half mile, mile later, I didn't mention John Neal, I just described the house because that's all he wanted to see. And I'm describing everything to him, and so I'm like, there's some grass over there, and now there's a lamp post, and this guy's all happy about the lamp post. I mean, it's just a lamp post. So it goes on and on, but something happened to me. It sounds bizarre, where I was actually, instead of always looking inward, which I think I'd always done before that time, I was looking outward. And then I began to realize that life is about what is and not what you think it is, or not even what it appears to be sometimes. Anyway, while I was talking to him, I suddenly had like a hysteria. I was laughing. I started laughing and stuff, and then a couple weeks later, I encountered a homeless man, and he started talking to me, and we're just talking and laughing instead of me being afraid. So now, I have no fear of going on stage. Now the only problem is that I have extreme sensitivities to things like literature or art. And uh, so he goes on from there. 
But um, when, when I heard this, well, first of all, I eliminated quite a few cuss words, just so you know, if you're looking for this quote. But, uh, you know, I read this and, and, and I thought, there's such, there's, he's, he has experienced something in his life that is true of what we're talking about here today, you know? The focus is on us, self-consciousness, it all clouds our vision, we don't see things as they are, we miss what's going on, what God's doing around us, and when we forget ourselves, wow, we, we become ourselves. Um, my apologies for an extended quote, but I have one more. This is from Rich Mullins, and he's talking about a similar idea. Interestingly, I kind of discovered both of these people uh, when they died. I just started looking into their lives a little bit and um, took to them, and they've, Rich Mullins in particular has made a big difference in my life. So even in our death, the Lord works. But Rich Mullen says this. Um, he's responding to something. He says, yeah, and especially in a day when so much emphasis and so much pressure is put on us to esteem ourselves. I kind of go, wow, I don't know how anyone can wake up with morning breath and pillow head and feel any self-esteem. That is not the sort of thing I want to put my faith in. And in the church, it is unbelievable to me that this whole foolishness about esteeming yourself has leaked into the church. I kind of go, Christ didn't ask us to esteem ourselves. I think if Christ were asked, I think he would probably say, look, buddy, you would be lucky if you could forget yourself. If you could lose yourself, you would be luckier than if you found yourself. It would be wonderful if you knew the names of trees between your house and where you work, between your house and your church. If you knew that this was a tulip tree and you knew that that was a red bud, it would be great if you knew the names of constellations. It would be great if you knew something about your neighbors. It would be a lucky thing for you if you forgot yourself, if you lost yourself. I remember when my brother and his fiance were eating a meal with us and it was absolutely sickening because we were trying to eat and here, uh, here they were staring at each other in the eyes and I'm going, Golly, can you not wait until after football? And then I realized, wow, what a terrific thing when you are so in love that you forget how obnoxious love looks to everybody else. Although I really appreciate modesty and I detest public displays of uh, affection, but nevertheless, what a wonderful thing when you are so caught up in a moment, when you are so lost in an experience that you forget to straighten your tie or to comb your hair why esteem yourself? Forget yourself. You'll have a lot more fun. Uh, the inward focus debilitates us. Just looking outward can, you know, really set us free to a great degree. But if we look upward, in addition to outward, then we really begin to see. If we love God and others, rather than focus on the self, then we really begin to see. Uh, I just remember as a child one time, my mom telling me she had moved at, I, I think she was either 10 or 12 years old, moved from Massachusetts to Illinois, tough age to move, didn't have friends, was very, very, very shy. And, uh, you know, night after night, she would have tears and her mother would pray with her and they would talk about it. and. Uh, she would get comfort from her mom, and then one night her mom, this started, and her mom said, okay, that's enough. And my mom said, what? And, she, and my grandmother said to her, I understand. We all know the issues, and we know what's, it's difficult, but maybe there's someone else at school that's lonely. Maybe there's someone else that doesn't have a friend. And maybe you could be a friend to someone else rather than waiting for everything to come to you. And made all the difference, a lesson that she kept with her and taught to her children. Well, the Bible is about Jesus. The world is about Jesus. Your life is about Jesus. Adam and Eve 
is about Jesus. So forget yourself to be freed from yourself. And in so doing, you'll become who God truly made you to be. Let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks for your word. We acknowledge that it is divinely inspired, that it is not like any other writing of, of fables or legends, that it is the word of God, that it is put together over centuries through your spirit. We thank you that we can see your hand in it. I pray that we would become uh, more in love with your word, that we would be able to read through it and, and see you in it and fall more in love with you. And Father, uh, just deliver us from ourselves. Uh, let us get beyond ourselves. Let us be able to worship you freely. Let us be able to uh, join what you are doing. And let us be able to, to lose our self-consciousness and, and to just be... Uh, fully aware of what you are trying to do around us and, and to be a part of it. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.